Hello history lovers and welcome back to my channel. In today's video we will delve into the intriguing early life of arguably Henry VIII's most beloved wife, Queen Jane Seymour. What makes Jane's life so interesting is the sheer little we know of it. While her reign was relatively brief, she was still able to leave her mark on the Tudor era. Join me as I uncover the lesser known chapters of Jane's life, exploring the circumstances that shaped her into the queen she would become. As with much of her early life, we don't know when Jane was born. However, it is thought that she was born around 1507 or 1508, as it is thought that she was 29 years old when she died, based off the amount of mourners she had. Jane was born to parents Sir John Seymour and Marjorie Wentworth, and was one of ten children and the eldest daughter, although not all ten children would make it to adulthood. It is thought that Jane and her siblings were born at Wolf Hall in Wiltshire. Jane was born into a wealthy family, but they were relatively powerless until Jane's marriage to the king. Jane's mother, Marjorie, was first cousin to Elizabeth Boleyn and Edmund Howard, the parents of Queen Anne Boleyn and Catherine Howard. Through her mother, Jane was also a descendant of King Edward III, and her mother was the half-cousin to Elizabeth Tilney, Countess of Surrey, who was a noted beauty. Thanks to their royal connections, the Seymours had over a hundred manors in 19 counties and five castles. Nothing definitive is known of Jane's education. We know that she could read and write, and it was likely that she was educated by the family chaplain at Walthall. Elizabeth Norton believes there is evidence that Jane was able to read and write, and she had at least some understanding of French, and perhaps a little Latin. Because of this, it is also thought that Jane had spent some time in France in the households of Mary Tudor and Queen Claude. This claim was also based on a portrait in the Louvre which was allegedly identified as Jane. Allegedly. However, it is most likely that she never left England. Either way, her education and intellect was nothing to that of her predecessors, Catherine and Anne. Jane's education was tailored more towards the skills that a gentlewoman would need in order to marry a man of her status and run a country estate, supervising a large household, so essentially accounting, cooking, diary management and needlework. The latter of which Jane excelled at. She would have used herbs for medicinal purposes, gone hunting, hawking, dancing and played some musical instruments, as well as being educated in the way of religion. Jane adored horses and owned a poodle. Norton supports this view, saying, This was the extent of Jane's education, and she received the solid teaching befitting a future country gentlewoman rather than that of a great lady in the making. In 1514, her older brother Edward Seymour was given the position of a page in the household of the Princess Mary Tudor, who was on her way to France to wed King Louis XII of France. Edward would have gone with Mary, however, he returned a few months later when King Louis died and Mary returned to England. So Jane would have been apart from her brother for a few months. There is no record of how this impacted Jane, or even if it did at all. As far as I'm aware, Jane did not attend the Field of the Cloth of Gold in 1520, however, her father, Sir John, did as part of King Henry VIII's retinue. Jane passed the usual age for marriage, and apart from one rumour, which again, annoyingly, I can neither confirm nor deny, there was no evidence of a match being sought for her, which I find very unusual for the time, as love was never a factor in these arrangements, or more accurately, business transactions. It has been suggested that maybe Jane didn't have a big enough dowry for an eligible match. However, I find this unlikely due to the Seymour family's wealth. It is commonly believed that Jane entered Catherine of Aragon's household as soon as she turned of age, but there is no evidence of this. Jane would later model her own reign off of Catherine's. 
Jane's mother, Marjorie, attended on Queen Catherine the same way that Elizabeth Howard, Lady Boleyn, did. They weren't regular ladies-in-waiting. However, they did attend on the Queen on important state occasions, and it may have been Marjorie who introduced Jane to Catherine on one of her visits. It is also possible that Sir Francis Bryan, Jane's half-second cousin, requested or supported a place for her, as he was a supporter of her later career. It is thought that Jane joined Queen Catherine's household in the late 1520s. If Jane had been in Catherine of Aragon's service, then it is very likely that she would get to know the Princess Mary, and she would have spent time with her cousin Anne Boleyn, who was also a maid of honour to the Queen. Jane would have been in a unique position to watch first hand the downfall of Queen Catherine, the rise of Anne Boleyn, and then witness the fall of another Queen. Jane would offer her sympathies to Catherine and later her friendship and motherhood to Catherine's daughter, Mary. The 11th of July 1531 was the last day that Catherine of Aragon saw her husband, as she was essentially exiled from court. It is unknown what happened to Jane, but Elizabeth Norton, Jane's biographer, believes that she stayed with Catherine as part of her entourage. But, on the other hand, my bay and favourite historian Alison Weir suggests that Jane had joined Anne's retinue. Either way, Jane's whereabouts from this point to Anne basically becoming queen are unknown. It is probable that Jane returned to Wolf Hall during this time. Really? No, not really. I can't back that up. By Christmas, Jane had most likely moved from Catherine's household to that of Anne Boleyn's, who was at this point reigning as queen, all except in title. Again, some may argue that Jane didn't join Anne until September 1535. On the 1st of January 1534, Henry VIII gave his customary New Year presents. And you'll never guess who got a prezi. Presents, please! To be exact, it was noted that a Mistress Seymour received a present. Again, Weir and Norton clash on who actually received this gift, with Alison stating it was Jane, while Elizabeth argues that it was Jane's sister-in-law, Anne Stanhope. However, Edward Seymour had his knighthood at this point, and so it would be more likely that if it was Anne Stanhope, she would have been referred to as lady rather than mistress. But again, it's not that simple, as this assumes that Edward and Anne were married in early 1533, which we just can't confirm. But I feel like it would be Jane. Otherwise, I'd be a bit miffed, wouldn't you? Like, you're trying to get me to be your mistress, but you don't buy me a present, but you get my sister-in-law one. Coincidence? I think not! On the 13th of October, 1534, the Imperial Ambassador Eustace Shapwee wrote a letter to Emperor Charles V, where he noted the rise of Jane Seymour in the King's affection, and the slow decline, and potentially a bit of panic on Anne's behalf. He writes, Of late days, Lord Rochford's wife has been banished, the court because she has conspired with the concubine to procure the withdrawal from court of the young lady whom this king has been accustomed to serve, whose influence increases daily, while that of the concubine diminishes, which has already abated a good deal of her insolence. The said young lady has of late sent to the princess to tell her to be of good cheer, and that her troubles would sooner come to an end than she supposed and that when the opportunity occurred, she would show herself true and devoted servant. According to the life of Jane Dormer, who was once a maid of honour to Queen Mary I, the Countess recounts she and her husband were approached by Sir Francis Bryan to suggest a match between Dormer's son and Jane Seymour in 1534. The Countess opposed the match, believing her son was too good for Jane. Allegedly... The Countess then arranged a marriage for her son elsewhere. There is no evidence to support Jane Dormer's account. However, it is certainly possible because of the lack of evidence. So it's just something to consider. On the 4th of September 1535, King Henry VIII, along with his wife and Queen Anne Boleyn, stayed at the Seymour family home of Wolfhall in Wiltshire for six days. 
Some cite this as when Henry and Jane's relationship starts. However, there is no evidence to support this either. In November 1535, both the courtiers and the queen herself became aware of the king's intentions to pursue Mistress Seymour, much like he had done with Anne. Jane concealed her ambitions through a charming demeanour and calm temperament. Guys, can you just feel my frustration on how little we know about Jane Seymour? I just can't cope. Jane, like Anne before her, resisted the king's advances while professing a chaste devotion to him. By November, the French ambassador had already noticed the king's renewed affection. Jane employed tactics similar to those used by Anne years earlier, resisting the king's amorous pursuits and expressing her desire to wait until marriage. Nevertheless, her virtue did not deter her from accepting the lavish gifts that Henry bestowed upon her. Funny that. As Henry's affection for Anne Boleyn grew with each rejection, so did his fascination with Jane. The court observed this shift closely, especially because Jane was perceived as a staunch supporter of Catherine and the Princess Mary, although I guess it's Lady Mary at this point, making her a prime target for Anne Boleyn's enemies. Beneath her modest facade, the ambitious Jane concealed her true intentions, deceiving many. Her aim was to utilise her abilities to sway the king to reconcile with the Church of Rome and reinstate Lady Mary in her rightful position in the line of succession. And this is where I'm going to leave today's episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, make sure to leave a like and subscribe if you haven't already. And if you really love this video, then why not leave a super thanks? But until the next one, have a wonderful day.